And uh, if you will, open your Bibles with me back to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3. We're going to use Mark 3 and Luke 6 as our primary texts this morning. Uh, very, very quickly, this is the last Sunday morning of the winter quarter. Hard to believe that we are a fourth of the way done, nearly in 2010. And what uh, the two guys in the back have been handing out is material for our next quarter to take us from April through June, Lord willing. Uh, please be sure to get a copy of that. Jeff has a copy of another packet that uh, has our timeline. We didn't recreate this for everybody. Most of you probably have this. But if you do not have a copy of, of our basic timeline that we handed out the first quarter, if you will, raise your hand and, and Jeff can get you a copy of that. That way, two basic packets, okay? A packet just with our six key questions for every week. Everyone should have gotten a copy of that. If you didn't, we'll have them available. And then Jeff has a specialized packet to catch people up who didn't get the packet at the beginning of the year. This is week 1 through 50, uh, our reading and, and really the direction for the entire study. The, the packet that everyone got just has 12 lessons. That's allowing for our gospel meeting that will be the last Sunday in April. And we'll turn that time over to Doug Roush. So, if all of that's as clear as mud and you've got questions, please see me afterwards and we'll make sure that you get your material. Um, in the meantime, thank you for being here. Thank you, Jeff. And we will get into Mark chapter 3 in just a moment. Before we do, if you will bow your heads, let's start off with a, a word of prayer together. <clears throat> Almighty and all-powerful, all-merciful Heavenly Father, we express our thanksgiving and our praise to You this morning. We thank You for this avenue of prayer and the blood of Your Son that has made our access to You possible. We thank You for the grace and the mercy that You have shown us in making our communication with You possible. We thank you for your patience and your willingness always to receive us and to allow us to come boldly before your throne of grace, even this very morning. Help us to be in awe and wonder at this great blessing, not just to address you as the almighty God of the universe, but as our Father who is in heaven. We pray that your special blessing would be on all of us today. Help us to appreciate what a great privilege it is to express our thanksgiving to you. Help us to do that with clear consciences. Help us to evaluate even at the beginning of this morning our relationship with you and, and help us to remove those barriers to cleanse our, our hands and our hearts. Help us throughout the day to offer the sacrifice of praise, the, the fruit of our lips that you are so worthy of. We pray that you would be with all who are studying throughout this building. We pray that you would be with us as we gather together in just a little while and remember and sing and pray and study and meditate together. We pray especially that you would be with those who would like to be with us this morning, but who are unable for a variety of reasons. Those who are traveling, those who are dealing with sicknesses, those who have been shut in for some time. We pray that you would continue to be with them and watch over them and use us as tools of encouragement and comfort. Father, we look forward to the day when we can be with you, where there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears. Help us to set our hearts on you at the beginning of this week, and it's through your Son that we offer our prayer. Amen. Okay, Mark chapter 3 is where we're going to be. If you haven't opened your Bibles back there, we are in week number 13, and we pick up the reading of Mark's gospel in chapter 3 and verse 7. 
you look back at, at uh, the earlier sections of Mark, particularly the latter half of Mark chapter 2, and you remember that most recently we have been with Jesus down in the area of Jerusalem, in the region of Judea, and uh, there has been great controversy, obviously, in the latter half of Mark chapter 2 as Jesus is uh, doing some miracles on the Sabbath day. He has garnered a great deal of tension. You begin reading in Mark chapter 2 and verse 23, Mark begins to document uh, some of what has gone on. And he has gotten especially the attention of the Jewish authorities. The beginning of Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Jesus entered the synagogue. There's a man with a withered hand, and it happens to be the Sabbath day, and he heals him. And we've talked about a lot of the controversy that is swirling around that. We left off in the parallel account of Mark chapter 3 and verse 6. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. And that's not going to let up because Jesus is not going to let up. We've been here, here in Jerusalem with him in the region of Judea. We're going to note how in Mark chapter 3 and verse 7, Jesus withdraws with his disciples to the sea. And we're talking about the region of the Sea of Galilee. From Jerusalem up to the Sea of Galilee. And he tells us in the latter part of verse 7 that a great crowd followed. And he mentions several different areas from Galilee. Okay, There's a, a whole region known as Galilee to the west of that great sea. And Judea, down where he has been. Jerusalem, just to the west of the Dead Sea. Ijumea south of Judea, from beyond the Jordan, that area where John the Baptist had been working out in the wilderness, and even up north in the area of Tyre and Sidon. Jesus has obviously done a great deal of work in Galilee. He has gone a couple of times down to Jerusalem. Now he goes back, and as he goes, we see the effect of this first year of his ministry. Okay, it's been about a year since he first stepped on the scene, but it's been a relatively quiet year. It begins across the Jordan with the baptism of John. He goes to Jerusalem. He meets with Nicodemus. He meets with that woman at the well in Samaria in John chapter 4. He has gone to Galilee. There have been healings there. Peter's mother-in-law, the whole village of Capernaum that gathers around. There's been a miraculous catch of fish on Galilee, there has been a leper, there's been a paralytic, there was the invalid man at the pool of Bethesda, there was the man with the withered hand, but there hasn't been great, great crowds that sit down and listen to Jesus give long discourses of teaching. That's next week, Lord willing, with what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. But we're really kind of setting the stage for that because Jesus has been all around. He has done some miraculous things. He has even been right there in Jerusalem and healed people on the Sabbath. He has begun, he has begun this give and take with the Pharisees. Now He goes back to Galilee, back to that real base of operations on the north side in the city of Capernaum. And people, not just in that little village of Capernaum, but now people from all over are following him. And he's going to have the opportunity, obviously, to give this great, great discourse that we have in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Okay? So we're kind of setting the table for that. In the latter part of Mark chapter 3 and verse 8, when the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirit saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Okay, this is 
Not the first time that we've run across that kind of language, right? Oh, keep your hand there and open your Bibles with me back to the book of Acts, chapter 16. We're going to note just a couple of examples from the book of Acts that correspond with this and deepen our understanding of what's going on. We've kind of run across this interesting dynamic in the Gospels. There are some very common people who believe Jesus is someone great. We haven't gotten to He's the Son of God yet, but they're willing to listen. Then you've got the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They don't for a moment, generally speaking, even want to entertain the idea that He's worthy of listening. But on the other end of the spectrum, we've got all of these unclean spirits and demons who know exactly who He is and are willing to confess exactly who He is and manifest a great deal of fear at His name. And that's going to continue on throughout the New Testament. We studied here recently, uh, several, several months ago, from the book of Acts, where you're familiar, odds are, with this account in Acts chapter 16. This is after Jesus has ascended, but this is what the apostles are able to do. We're going to note here in just a little while the introduction of the apostles and what they are equipped by Jesus to be able to do. That carries on even beyond Jesus' ascension back into heaven. Here's an example. Acts 16 and verse 16. As we were going, Luke is with Paul, as we were going to the place of prayer and were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit... I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. How is Paul able to do that? It isn't just Paul, right? It isn't that Paul was born with this ability or through intensive study and prayer was somehow able to discover how to do this kind of thing. It's in the name of Jesus Christ. And that goes back It's got roots in the Gospels that we're studying now. A few pages later in Acts chapter 19 and verse 11, same kind of thing where Luke gives us an idea of the incredible things that are going on because of Jesus' commission of men like Paul. Verse 11, God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them. Then the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. They had seen Paul do that kind of thing. And here they are saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaimed. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them. Some of the most ironically amusing words in Scripture. Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit leaped on them mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. It's one thing to get beat up. It's another thing to get your clothes beat off of you. That's what goes on here. This, they are tangling with someone who is not... It's beyond them, right? Right? But what happens? This became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. What ought we to take away from Acts 16, Acts 19? What, why do we have those kinds of things recorded? And what's the common element there? The name of the Lord Jesus, right? What does Luke want us to read into that? 
Alan? Jesus is not just a person. Okay. That's what we're grappling with here in the early chapters of the Gospels, right? This is more than just a person. Good observation. Ed, you had your hand raised? Yeah, he's showing the power and authority that, that he had. Okay. Yeah. It's not just Paul. It's Jesus. It wasn't just this, these men. They tried to do it on their own, right? And are unsuccessful and tangle with this bad dude who, who absolutely whips them. It's the name of the Lord Jesus, the authority of the Lord Jesus that is making this possible. Even the demons at the name of Jesus tremble. That's the big point, right? Okay, you've got human beings, that's one thing, and you've got evil, unclean spirits, that's another thing, and they can do these horrible things to human beings, but above and exceedingly beyond any unclean spirit you want to talk about is the authority of Jesus. That's the big point, right? That's what we need to get out of Acts 19 and Acts 16. And we go back to our text in Mark chapter 3. That, that's really the point here as well, right? Whenever the unclean spirits saw Him, He didn't even have to say anything. They just see Him and they fall down before Him and cry out and they say, You are the Son of God. We don't just read over that as, well, a a passively interesting detail and and we really want to get into the things that Jesus said. No, this tells us why we need to listen to what Jesus says, right? It's the same practical effect as what's going on here in the book of Acts. Why should we listen to Paul? Well, this is why we should listen to Paul. Because he's doing these things in the name of the Lord Jesus and he's not getting beat to a bloody pulp like these people are. You can just have handkerchiefs that Paul has touched and if they come in contact with people who are sick, they're healed. Something about this man is special and whatever it is that he's saying, we ought to listen to. Something about this name of Jesus is remarkable. And even though Paul didn't have anything to do with what goes on here in Acts 19, we still have the practical effect. The name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. It was revered. It was spread in a very respectful way. That's the point of the miracles. We want to reinforce that over and over and over again. Very contrary to what we see today. This wasn't about exalting Paul. This wasn't about exalting Peter or anybody else you want to talk about. This was about the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and verifying why we ought to listen to Him and His hand-picked followers. Okay, keep your hand there. We'll come back to Mark chapter 3. Keep your marker there. Turn back with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. There's one element that we want to set the stage with before we look at the, uh, the selection of the apostles. Matthew chapter 4, kind of parallel account of what's going on here. Verse 23, He went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God and healing every disease and every affliction among all the people. And Matthew documents how the the reputation is spreading. One phrase in particular that we want to zero in. Yes, He's healing every disease and every affliction among the people, but He is proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God of God or of heaven, depending on which context we're reading, those phrases that are attached to that every once in a while. Let's dissect that a little. Here is Jesus. He is healing, yes, but it's more than just healing, right? As He heals, as the crowds come, He's got a proclamation. It's the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom. And we're going to, again, read that phrase a number of different times. What does Matthew want us to read into that? What does he want us to take away from that? He's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Well, what is that? And why should we care? Richard? Matthew, I mean, 
Paul says the gospel is a part of God and the salvation. If you have any hope of salvation, you've got to be allowed to have come from. Okay. The only thing that Christ teaches is that gospel. You know, when I was a kid, the one of the sayings we had, he told somebody it was absolute truth. He said it was the gospel. Yeah. Gospel truth. <laughs> uh, the, whether it's certain gospel, no matter what it's concerned, if we said it was the gospel, they understood that we did it was absolute truth. Okay. And this is what we got to understand about this. It's the absolute truth about one thing. And that is our salvation. Okay. And all pertains to that. Okay. All revolves around that. Dave, go ahead. Jason, I was just going to uh, say, you know, uh, Matthew's account is focused on and making sure Jews understand that Jesus is the king. Yeah. And so all the prophecies and uh, all the things uh, from the Old Testament, I mean, he's meticulous about <clears throat> pointing out this fulfilled this prophecy, this fulfilled that, and the whole of ten is to make sure people understand he's the king. And if he's the king, he's the king over a new kingdom. Okay. Not the one they're thinking about. Uh, but a, a spiritual kingdom yeah. different. And that's, that's the good news because everyone can be saved. Yeah. yeah. You follow the progression of thought. Who is this Jesus? Well, in Matthew's gospel, he is the king. The one who goes all the way back to those prophecies of David and his kingdom. He is the deliverer. He is the Messiah. He is the king of the Jews. Every king has what? He's got a kingdom, right? Without a kingdom, you're not much of a king, are you? And so the, the king has a message about the kingdom. Is it good or bad news? It's wonderful news, right? That, that's inherent in that word gospel. Jesus is coming, proclaiming good news of the kingdom. Like Richard has said, it's got a source. This is not good news about the kingdom of Judah. Or Israel, is it? It's bigger than that. This is good news of the kingdom of heaven. That's where this kingdom is coming from. Lord willing, next week we're going to get into Matthew 5 and 6 and 7. We're even going to kind of set the table for that in our assembly this morning. This is good news of the kingdom. What we read as Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's been referred to as the constitution of the kingdom of heaven and, and very, very aptly so. Here he is, he's going throughout this area and he's proclaiming good news about something these people can be a part of. They can be a part of it, right? They're not born into it. They were born as descendants of Abraham. They, they were born as citizens of this uh, little kingdom under the thumb of the Roman emperor. There is a birth attached to this, but it doesn't have anything to do with what happened at the beginning of their time on this earth. He hinted at that with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, the new birth, right? Alan, go ahead. This is not an ordinary kingdom either. It's a yeah. righteous for the righteous people yeah. to live for eternity. Yeah. There is a choice that is involved in becoming a part of this kingdom, Right? Those who are unwilling to hear the king aren't going to become a part of this kingdom, right? Those who were not willing to listen to the message that started with John the Baptist, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Those who are not willing to turn from their unrighteousness won't be a part of this kingdom. Okay, So yes, there are healings going on. Yes, there are unclean spirits who are in absolute submission even at the very sight of Jesus. But it's still rooted in the message, right? We're not revolving around the healings. We're revolving around the message. That's the core of this. And the healings are the why I ought to listen to the message that is being proclaimed. Okay, let's go back to Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. This, this is what Jesus has been doing. And in Mark chapter 3, verse 13, He went up on the mountain and called to Him those whom He desired. And they came to Him. 
Keep your hand there and turn with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke records for us a good detail. Luke 6 and verse 12. Same parallel account, okay? Luke gives us one thing that comes just before his selection. Look at verse 12. In these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. Why is that an important detail? I mean, Luke 6 is going to go on with the selection of the 12. Mark is going on with the selection of the 12. Why draw attention to Luke 6 and verse 12? As we read this, what ought that to communicate to us? He's praying to God to help him make the correct decision. Choose Ten. Ten. He needs. Ten. This is a God thing. God is involved here. And uh, within the Godhead, the Son is communing with the Father. Anything else that we ought to take away from this, practically speaking? One thing he continues all night. Okay. He continues all night in prayer. This is a fervent prayer. John? Prayer is obviously practically a, a good measure before making an important decision. Yeah. You know, if the Son of God, before, I mean, you know, we read kind of the after effects in Acts 16 and Acts 19 of what these men were able to do. And yet, like, like we've said, it's bigger than just the healings, right? These are the men who are going to begin the fulfilling of that great commission. These are the men who hear that with their own ears. You and I go back and read Matthew 28 and Mark 16. These men heard it. Okay, We build on their foundation. They are the ones who begin that work. These are the men who are going to stand there in Acts 2 in the middle of that city, the, the, these people who were responsible for the death of Jesus just a few weeks prior, they're going to stand up and say, listen, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. These are these men. This is a big decision. And if Jesus sees fit to spend the night in prayer before this kind of decision, what does that say about us? Yeah, we, we, we ought to do more praying before decisions, right? Isn't that one of the things that comes through loud and clear? Jesus calls these men to Himself. I'm back in Mark chapter 3 and verse 14. He appointed twelve whom He also named apostles. And so we've got this ever-increasing group of disciples. Disciples literally means what? Yeah, a follower, a, a learner, a student, okay? These men, these twelve, are still going to be followers and learners and students, but he's going to take from that pool of students and select twelve apostles. That means what? Apostles means... Messengers. Yeah, messengers, someone who is sent. Dave, yeah. Someone who has been commissioned by someone in authority to go do something, to go spread something, right? This is Jesus, not just as King, but as teacher, as Master, as Lord. He, he's going to name these apostles so that they might be with Him and He might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons, okay? That's why we started out with that story, okay? Here is Jesus and, and uh, the demons just see the sight of Him and fall down and, and proclaim that He is the Son of God. The key difference between these men and men like those seven sons of Sceva in Acts chapter 19 is these men are, are going to progressively grow in their ability to do these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's going to be a process, right? Uh, we're going to note later on at the scene of transfiguration, Jesus has uh, Peter and James and John and the other nine are down and they're tangling with this unclean spirit and they can't do it. I mean, he doesn't 
beat them like he does those, those sons of Sceva, but they're unable to cast it out. It's a process, right? That's going to continue on over the course of the next two years. Verse 16, he appointed the twelve. And Mark lists them for us. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him for they were saying, he is out of his mind. We're going to talk a little bit more about his family as we move along. Let's end our time back in the Gospel of Luke chapter 6. Let's go back here. We went to Mark because he gives us a, a, a few other little details or nicknames that we're going to run across One thing I want to draw attention to before we close in the Gospel of Luke chapter 6. In connection with Simon, latter part of verse 15. Simon who was called the Zealot and Judas the son of James and Judas Iscariot who became a a betrayer. Okay, Matthew is mentioned earlier. I want to kind of key in on Matthew and Simon here. Because there's an interesting dynamic that we can read right over if we don't pay attention. Matthew, by trade, was a what? (laughs) Tax collector, right? Jews, as far as tax collectors were concerned, or or tax collectors, as far as Jews were concerned, were what? (coughs) Traitors, right? I mean, these were Jews who had been commissioned by Rome to collect taxes from Jews. Okay, so you got a tax collector, and then you've got Simon, who is a zealot. Any idea culturally and historically what a zealot was? An insurgent. This was a Jewish freedom fighter. He was a patriot. Okay, this was someone who did not like Rome one iota, who in fact was going to be willing to fight and bleed and die if somehow he could be a part of liberating the Jews from Rome. Tax collectors are viewed as Roman sympathizers, traitors to the cause of Jewish independence. Zealots are the freedom fighters who are going to actively work to overthrow overthrow the Romans. The zealots are the ones who are ultimately going to provoke the Romans in the latter 60s AD that eventually leads to the destruction of Jerusalem. What happens, generally speaking, do you think when you get a tax collector and a zealot in a crowd together? Yeah, they don't like each other. I mean, that's like mixing oil with water. But what does that say about this kingdom, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is going around proclaiming? And we've got specifically mentioned, you know, Bartholomew, we don't have a whole lot of details. Thaddeus, you know, we, we've, we've, details are very sparing. But we've got Matthew, who is specifically mentioned as a tax collector, and Simon, who is specifically mentioned as a zealot. Why? What does that tell us about this kingdom and about what's going on among these closest to followers of Jesus? Nancy? It means that the kingdom of God is available to everyone. Yeah. So whatever your color, whatever your work, okay. it's open to everybody. Not okay. just like you. It is open to everyone as long as they recognize this is different, right? Maybe Simon doesn't completely grasp that yet, but he will. Simon, this kingdom is not going to come by, you know, carrying around a sword. Matthew, this is not about collecting taxes to pad our wallets in the kingdom of heaven. This is something different. And it's going to begin breaking down walls between people, between tax collectors and zealots between Jews 
and Samaritans and even Jews and Gentiles. There are things that separated us before we were a part of this kingdom, but when we're a part of this kingdom, there is something that binds us together despite those past differences. As long as we come to the kingdom on the king's terms. Okay, we'll continue to flesh that kind of thing out as we move along. Thank you for being here. We're going to spend our time this week reading from Matthew 5 and 6 and 7.